Okay, Steve. So um, now we don't have access to a retinoscope, so we're not looking at retinoscopy at this stage. So how would you then start the process of doing the refraction to help with the distance prescription? So let's assume, first of all, we're just going to look at spherical prescriptions. Right. And you would have some clues from what the person has told you as to what kind of prescription they have. So if they've told you that they can't see well far away, but they can see up close, then you would be thinking they're probably uh, short-sighted. If, on the other hand, they can't see at any distance, then you would be thinking perhaps they're long-sighted or perhaps there is astigmatism present. So let's... Um, take the uh, scenario of a short-sighted person then who's not seeing well far away but is seeing quite well up close. Now for this person the amount that they can see in the distance is also going to help you. It's going to give you some idea of how short-sighted the person is. So if they're not seeing any letters on your chart then they're probably sort of minus three or more short-sighted. If they're seeing halfway down the chart then maybe they're sort of minus one and a half. If they can't see anything on their chart and, and if you uh, show them something to read up close, they hold it like this, just on the end of their nose, then they may be highly short-sighted, minus 10 or something of that sort. So let's assume that they're not really seeing very much on the chart, maybe only the top letters. Then my first thing that I would put in would be something like a minus 2. I'd put a minus 2 in and I'd say, is that better? And they would probably read a little bit further down my chart. And then you could add another minus 2 and then another one until things stop getting better or until they say that's now getting worse. Okay? You don't at this stage want to start um, fiddling about with minus 025s or minus 050s because the person will not see the difference. So you go through your, your, your minus twos until it's no longer getting any better or until it's begun to get a little bit worse and then you could try plus and minus ones. So you could try a minus one and see if that improves things or a plus one and see if that improves things. You have to remember where you've been. So if you've come from uh, nothing and you've gone to say minus four and then the next lens isn't getting any better then it's unlikely that with your plus and minus ones you're going to go right back down to nothing again. You're going to be looking somewhere between somewhere around minus four, minus five for the result. And then when you are finding that a plus one and a minus one are both worse than the lens that you have, then you would try a plus and a minus 050, and then a plus and a minus 025 at that stage, and that would be uh, the end of your spherical assessment. Now you do have to be careful with younger patients because younger patients have very active focusing mechanisms for, uh, accommodation within the eye and so it's very easy for them to become over minus. That's what we call it, over minus, where you have made the minus correction too strong and they are accommodating through that and they feel that things are getting blacker and easier to see. So to check for over minusing, you could put a plus one onto your final best vision sphere result and that should make things uh, go blurred. So as a rule of thumb, if you have the best prescription possible, then if you put plus one, it should blur things back by uh, to six over 12. So three or two or three lines back up the chart mm -hmm. should come off if you put a plus one in. So that's for um, someone with short-sighted. Now, how about somebody who is perhaps long-sighted? So if somebody's long-sighted, so they have a plus prescription, things are going to depend a little bit on how old they are. Because if they're young and long-sighted, then they again, they have a lot of focusing power and they like to use it. So if you introduce a plus lens, they may feel that that's not quite as good as doing the focusing themselves. If they're old and long-sighted, then they don't have much focusing power themselves and they will be very keen to have those plus lenses uh, put up in front in the trial frame. So again, depending on how, um, how uh, blurred things are, that will determine what sort of lens you use. So if they can't see anything on the chart at all, then again, I would start by putting a plus two in and seeing whether things are, are better and then perhaps another plus two and so on. If when you start they're seeing halfway down the chart, it might be better to start with a plus one, and then add another plus one, and so on uh, like that. 
Once you find that a, a further plus one makes everything go blurred or they don't feel as happy with it, then try a plus 050 or maybe a minus 050 and see whether going back a little bit helps. And then again, finish off with plus and minus 025s. So that, that's arriving at the best vision sphere. Um, now, how can you, is there a way that you can tell whether they have astigmatism or not once you've got the best vision sphere in place? Well, I would say there are two um, relatively easy uh, techniques. My preferred technique would be to use a, uh, a cross cylinder, but if you have a fan and block available, then you can have a look for the presence of astigmatism using a fan and block. Uh, generally, you should start with the, um, with the best vision sphere in place, and you should ask the person to look at the fan and block and then you should add a plus 050 lens, so a plus 050 lens, and then you could ask the person whether any of the lines on the fan and block appear clearer than others, or if any of the lines appear less clear than others. And if they're all looking pretty much the same, then that suggests that the, um, there isn't any significant astigmatism. To be absolutely sure, you should then add another plus 050. So you've added plus one on top of your best vision sphere. And again, ask whether any of the lines look clearer uh, or less clear than others. And if there is a difference, then that suggests that there is astigmatism. If, on the other hand, all the lines appear fairly equally clear, then that suggests there isn't any astigmatism. The way of looking with a cross cylinder um, is more complicated, but perhaps more reliable. So, uh, Stephen, we've, we've run through subjective refraction using the trial lenses and getting to the best vision sphere. Now, you did mention about the uh, retinoscopy, and uh, I'd just like you to explain a little bit about how you do retinoscopy, how it works. Okay, so this is a retinoscope, and a retinoscope, retinoscopy is a way of what we call objective refraction. So it's a way of finding the uh, refraction, the prescription for glasses, without having to ask the patient any questions. Okay, so what it relies on is um, the fact that the retinoscope has a, has, a, has a light in it, so it shines light into the eye, and then the light will uh, hit the retina, which will be illuminated, and the light will then come back out of the eye, and then you can observe that light using the retinoscope. You'll notice there's a little hole in the retinoscope just here, and you look through that hole to observe the light coming back from the eye. So the way in which one uh, does retinoscopy is, uh, let's say I was going to do retinoscopy on Ian, and I would get Ian to look past me into the distance. I would need the room lights off to do this, and then I shine the light into Ian's eye like this, and then I'm observing how the uh, reflection of the light moves. So there are probably three possible ways in which the way in which the light can move. So if you move the retinoscope, you rotate the retinoscope, and the light could move the same way, or as you rotate the retinoscope this way, the light moves the other way. When it moves in the same direction, we call that a with movement. When it moves in the opposite direction, we call that an against movement. And sometimes it may be that it is not really moving either way, and that we call reversal. So how you actually determine what's going on is that you look at the uh, patient's eye, you would have the room lights off, and you shine your retinoscope in, and then you will see this particular reflection, the with movement or the against movement, and then you add lenses uh, in front of the eye, like this, holding them in, or if you're using a trial frame, dropping them into the trial frame, and you're aiming to find that point of reversal. And then with the retinoscope, you can of course move the retinoscope up and down as well as side to side. You can move it obliquely at an angle as well. And so you are trying to find uh, a combination of lenses which achieves reversal uh, in all directions. And that would be your final end result. One thing that you do have to be careful about with retinoscopy is that you are not 
you are working at a particular distance away so you have to use a working distance lens so if you're working at uh, this sort of distance two-thirds of a meter uh, or my arm's length I would put a plus 150 lens in there so that's what I would be using so um, generally speaking what you would do if you were using a trial frame such as this is probably it's easiest to start with a pair of plus 150 lenses into the trial frame and then work and do your uh, and get your retinoscopy result and then you remove the plus 150 lenses at the end and then that is your answer your retinoscopy result and it's important to do subjective refraction as well so where you're changing lenses and ask people uh, whether lenses are better or worse because that's a good way of checking your retinoscopy result retinoscopy is an art it's something you have to learn it's something that will take weeks or months to become good at not hours or days and uh, at first you may find that when you determine the subjective refraction it's a long way from what you thought it was from your retinoscopy but hopefully as time goes on you'll find that it becomes nearer and nearer and you'll then learn uh, what correction you have to make to your retinoscopy perhaps you have to take a certain plus one off or plus 050 off or something like that in order to get from retinoscopy to subjective and at that point you know um, that if you can't obtain a subjective refraction with a patient you can work with your retinoscopy and just do small modifications and then you can prescribe a reasonable pair of glasses. So um, just to reiterate, that you, you use a lens for the working distance. Um, in your case, it's a plus 150. Is, is that the same for everyone, or is it? Does Most it people will work at about that sort of distance, uh, so a plus 150 working distance lens. It's about it, right. It's about right. I suppose I could also mention a couple of other controls on the retinoscope. You have a, a switch here that moves the aperture. I would leave it on full all the time, and you have another uh, slider here which um, alters the um, convergence of the retinoscope beam, I would just leave that down at the bottom all the time. And uh, apart from keeping it dark, that's uh, about it really. So um, if you're doing retinoscopy and you've got width movement, what sort of lenses would you need to correct that again? Then you add more plus, and uh, as you add more plus, let's say you're working uh, this way, so you're working um, up and down, yeah, and you're seeing a width movement. Then, as you add plus lenses, there will come a point where suddenly you're getting an against movement. Then you could reduce the amount of plus a little bit until you get a width movement again, and then perhaps you sh you could just go in between those lenses, and you may then find not very much movement visible at all. That's your reversal, reversal. in that meridian. In that meridian. Yeah. So generally, what you do is you work to find the most plus meridian. So let's say I'm working this way, and I've got my reversal, I've got everything right here, and then I try going this way, so I decide, and I find I've got width movement again. Then I would add more plus okay until I've got reversal going this way and at that point then I would add cylinder um, in order to come back to reversal here so that's kind of how you would work it you look for your most plus meridian first and uh, find reversal in that meridian and then use minus cylinder in order to achieve reversal in the other meridian